Hello and welcome to TFR This Feels Right. I'm your host, Joel Silverstone, and for over 20 years, I've been helping people in business and sometimes in life to be more influential using their communication skills, to influence without being manipulative. So what that means is to be able to communicate and connect to the logic, and most importantly, to be able to communicate and connect to the emotions. Uh, today's show, I'm really excited. It's about tapping into our creativity and innovation mindset. Uh, this is so timely for where we are at in our lives. And we've got the right guest for that. We've got Duncan Wardle, the former head of innovation and creativity at a little company called Disney. Uh, Duncan uh, and his team were involved for innovative and creating magical new storylines and experiences for such companies as Imagineering, Lucasfilm, Pixar, and of course, Disney Parks. Duncan is now the founder uh, of Idea8 and Innovate. He's a multiple TEDx speaker, uh, and he now shares his unique approach and insights and experience uh, around the world on how people can use their creativity and innovation to create those better storylines. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into our discussion with Duncan and see how you listeners can be able to uh, learn about maybe changing some of your mindsets and challenging the way that you are thinking. Uh, this is where we're going to go. We're, you know, we're, we're all a little bit lost. Um, we all of a sudden have a blank canvas in front of us. The world changed a lot faster than anybody uh, could have predicted. So what everybody wants to know, Duncan, and, and this is why we're going to look to your expertise on this, is how can we redirect ourselves? How can we tap into our creativity and innovation um, to really maybe change our way of thinking or change our, our approach to, to how we're going to work uh, moving forward? Well, I think there's a couple of approaches. I, I guess the first one is do the right thing. Do what you think is the right thing. So mm -hmm. everybody's trying to step up right now. And, but Richard Branson went further than anybody else. Richard Branson said, look, I'm an airline. We're in trouble. I'm going to personally give out of my wealth $250 million to help save as many jobs in my company as I can. Because he could. But I haven't heard a single other executive on the planet say the same thing. So if we think about doing the right thing, I once worked out when I worked at Walt Disney World how many uh, directors, vice presidents, senior vice presidents, executive vice presidents, presidents, etc. This was after the mortgage crisis of 2009. And I calculated what their bonuses and um, share packages looked like. And I said, you know what, if we gave up one of our and one year, one year, our annual bonus and our annual uh, um, share package, we could save x thousand jobs for three years. And I just I challenge everybody in every industry is to think about doing the right thing first. Uh, and I think that should be the first thing we do. Secondly, I think I look around for very practical examples of what people are already doing. We are, it, the wonderful thing about the human race is, you know, the, the biggest skill set we have is creativity, you know, mm. which is one of the few skill sets that won't be programmable in the next decade. So for example, a very small distillery company in uh, Western Canada started to reproduce, uh, uh, change their production facility into uh, cr producing hand sanitizer because they could. Two gentlemen in Italy uh, were, uh, were contacted by a hospital that couldn't, because Italy is going through awful problems at the moment, they couldn't produce enough filters as quickly as they could for the ventilators and people were dying. So these guys came out of nowhere, two young entrepreneurs, they brought their 3D printer in, it took them about two hours to create the model, and then they were banging out ventilators, goodness knows how many per hour, for less than a dollar a unit and saving hundreds of people's lives. Now you take the young people, so there was a high school in Japan who um, they were going to miss their high school graduation and they were distraught. But so one of them was a Minecraft player. He plays Minecraft. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what? I'm going to recreate our school gym. I can recreate all of our faces from our high school book. I can recreate all of the, the teachers' faces. And we're going to do our high school graduation live in Minecraft. And just before I got on this podcast, I live in a subdivision in Florida. Our local high school, the Panthers, God bless them. Um, I... 350 cars came past our house. They asked us all to come out and wave and cheer. And all we did was cheer as loudly as we could because this was the only graduation ceremony these seniors were going to get. Oh. And so, you know, people are, and that costs nothing, right? Yeah. So, 
So it's just about thinking differently and asking ourselves, how might we? I think the other thing is the rules have changed, right? So mm -hmm. look at all these. So, for example, uh, the airline industry, the rules just changed. The cruise industry, the rules just changed. But there's also industries that have been around for a very, very long time that nobody's ever challenged the rules. So, for example, go back to 2004 in central Florida. And this is why I think there's going to be the acceleration of lots of industries that will go under if they don't pivot and think differently. And I'm going to give you a tool to help you think differently in just a moment. But okay. to set it up, it, before the hurricanes of 2004 rolled through central Florida, everybody used to drive up and down the I-4 to get to work. There was a loop road called the Greenway, but nobody wanted to use it because you had to pay a toll until the three hurricanes came to town. And suddenly we couldn't get up and down the I-4 because it was blocked with trees. So suddenly everybody started to use the Greenway. And of course they discovered it. They realized how much quicker and faster it was. And eventually everybody evolved to the Greenway. So now take a look at the different industries, but physical retail which was already under challenge mm -hmm. and being challenged um, by online services. Well, probably the, you know, the late baby boomers probably haven't all discovered online shopping yet, but you know what? The next 90 <laughs> days, they're going to discover it really quickly. And so the acceleration of online shopping is coming really, 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 really fast. Sports are going to big sports venues already. Online gaming is beginning to challenge what, you know, I've, done some work recently with the NBA. They've put a stake in the ground that they believe virtual basketball revenue will exceed real basketball revenue within less than 20 years from today. So yeah. they piloted, a, I think it was last year, the uh, Orlando Magic against the New York Knicks, the virtual team. Uh -huh. instead of the real team so they draft kids just yeah. like a, a real draft and they get paid lots of money <laughs> right. but instead of getting 12 or 14,000 people to a game they got way more than that at Madison Square Gardens plus millions of people online and so uh -huh. that, so I actually and look at the closure of the Olympics this year do I believe there will, there will be a virtual gaming Olympics by the year 2040 yes I do and so but again so sports has to think about how they will pivot um, other the conference industry so uh, the, 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 the work industry we're going to learn very, very quickly in the next 90 days that a good 50% of us don't actually need to go into an office every day because guess what? We can do the job from home. And suddenly, the, you know, the, that industry, the com online conference industry, Zoom that we're using right now, yeah. is going to be, you know, the, the rent I could save. So that's going to have to pivot really quickly. And then you look at the conference industry. Will we all still go to conferences where thousands of people sit together and hear people? With, so think about the carbon offset emissions of bringing thousands of people together to sit in the conference. Virtual conferencing will start to accelerate so these industries that have sort of stayed behind as it is so for example uh, i call it i gave a talk recently about the death of the marketing economy and the birth of the experience economy and what do i mean by that well generation z will not but generation z these young people are coming up they're not going to own houses they're not going to own cars they're buying experiences how do i know that they're already telling us why do you, where do we think airbnb came from where did escape rooms come from where did craft breweries come from where did the museum of ice cream come from they're all creating the experience the experience economy will dominate the traditional economy so if you're a physical retail store that sells products and services off the shelf then that's all you are i can buy you on amazon so create an experience where i can come and be engaged and some brands have got it right some brands so for example museums Let's be honest, museums are boring. I'm sorry, did I, that was my inside voice. <laughs> yes, it's true. So we heard it, I just, yeah. <laughs> I just watched, I watched a little boy in Brussels about six months ago. I felt like a dinosaur. He, um, he reached out and tried to swipe a painting because he thought he could. Because right. he's used to being able to touch the screen. And I thought, yeah. God. So to him, this is really boring, but it's an amazing painting. But what if Vincent van Gogh could pop out of the painting through augmented reality, tear his ear off, and tell this little boy about why he tore his ear off? suddenly that would bring that painting to life in a way in which this so, and augmented reality is not expensive and yeah. so if you look about you know so physical environments you know mm -hmm. a very small way of pivoting and getting people to engage you know i i work for somebody um that recently did some work for a, somebody who runs their own planet fitness franchise and they said well we can't create enough marketing we don't have the money we don't have the people i said well how many people you got she said two okay mm -hmm. i said okay i said and how many members do you have she said uh, i think it was God, it was over tens of thousands of people anyway. And I said, well, okay. I said, well, wait a minute. Why don't you stop doing your marketing and let your consumer do it for you? And she said, well, what do I mean? I said, you've got tens of thousands of people coming through your gymnasiums month in, month out. And what are they doing? They're taking selfies. 
Why yeah. are they taking selfies? Because they want to show their mates they look better than them. And I said, why don't you curate that content and allow the consumer to create your content for you? It's far more authentic. It's far more credible. You can reach people with paid advertising, but there's no credibility to it. So how might we, for certain brands, um, actually curate the content, not create the content, but become content curators it's just a different way of thinking and so in these times i think one of the one of the things one of the tools i would like to give people is what i call what if uh, what okay. if is about challenging all look, we all have rules in our industry it doesn't matter which you know you hear people say oh i work in the in the healthcare industry we have more rules than you i'm like no you don't <laughs> Walt Disney World hosts tens of millions of people a year. You can believe there's lots of rules around architecture, engineering, public safety, et cetera, et cetera. And it's about taking the rules of your industry and challenging them. So why do we do weekly reports? Because we've always done weekly reports. Why do we do mm -hmm. weekly meetings? We've always done weekly meetings. And so, so to give you an analogy, in 1940, Walt created a film called Fantasia. And it was a classical masterpiece set to classical music, but he wanted it to mist inside the theater during the sequence of Sorcerer's Apprentice when there was water on the screen. He wanted heat pumped in when there were flames on the screen. And the theater owner said, no, Walt, that's not the way we do it here. We've always done it this way. And Walt said, so he listed the rules of going to a movie theater. I must sit down, I must be quiet, I must watch a movie, I must watch the previews, I have to go at a set time. And he chose the rule, I, Walt, can't control the environment. He said, well, what if I can control the environment? Well, that's not provocative enough. The more absurd and provocative your what if question, the faster you'll get out of your river of thinking, your area of expertise and your area of experience and think differently. So he said, well, what if I take my movies out of the theater? Well, if you know how to do it, it's not innovation, it's iteration. And he said, well, okay, if I take my movies out of the theater, well, clearly they couldn't be two dimensional because I don't own the screens and the screens would fall over anyway. But what if I made them three dimensional? Well, that's interesting. Well, if I made them, how would I do that? Well, I'd have to make, I'd have to have people play the characters. Well, if I had people play the characters, they'd have to wear a costume. Well, if they have to wear a costume, they'd need to be themed. So I need a theme land around them so people will be immersed in their stories. Well, if, I'm, if I need to immerse them in their stories, Cinderella couldn't live next to Davy Crockett or Jack Sparrow because people wouldn't be immersed in her story. Well, what if I put them in different lands? Oh, wait a minute, I'll call it Disneyland. Now, fast forward to the year 2005, you and I used to go to Blockbuster Video. You mm -hmm. probably have more late fees than I did, but I probably have more late fees than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. So um, the founder of Netflix had $130 worth of late fees on Apollo 13. So he listed the rules of going to Netflix. I must drive to a physical store. I can only go during opening hours. I can only get three at a time. They never have the one I want on opening day weekend. I have to have a membership card. I must take them back or I must pay a late fee. And he took one rule. Uh, the rule of drive to a physical store. And he said, well, what if there was no physical store? Mm -hmm. And that's an absurd question. But because he asked the absurd question, he got out of his river of expertise and experience and said, well, wait a minute, YouTube existed 10 or 15 years ago. Well, wait a minute, YouTube streams amateur content. Well, what if I stream professional content? Well, if I stream professional content, well, what if I did a deal with the movie studios where I could actually create a streaming service where nobody drives anywhere, everybody gets what they want on opening day weekend, and nobody has to rewind anything, and nobody has to take anything back. I'll cut the rental off after 24 hours. Nobody pays a late fee. I'll take my idea to Blockbuster Video five times. They'll turn me down five times, and I'll take them out of business in less than five years. Now, it's easy for very small organizations and small entrepreneurs to look at this and say, well, how the hell could I do that? Disney has millions and Netflix has millions. I would respectfully disagree. Walt had no money in 1940. He was bankrupt, and Reed Hastings was working out of a garage in 2005. However, I'll give you a smaller analogy to bring it home. Very small company in Nottingham in Great Britain in the 70s. They had 26 employees. They uh, made glasses that we drink out of, and they noticed during the packing, shipping, and wrapping too much breakage and not enough production. So they went down to their shop floor and watched the production process and listed the rules. 26 employees, conveyor belts, cardboard boxes, 12 glasses to a box, glasses separated by corrugated cardboard, glasses wrapped in newspaper, employees reading the newspaper. So somebody asked the relatively provocative what if question, what if we poke their eyes out? Well, that's against the law and it's not very nice. But because they had the courage to ask the absurd what if question, somebody sitting next to him said, well, wait a minute, 
why don't we just hire blind people? So they did. Production went up 20%, breakage went down over 70%, and the British government gave them a 50% salary subsidy for hiring people with disabilities. Um, you want to know where Uber came from? Uber came from two blokes walking into a bar. Sounds like the front line of a, a joke. But it was one o'clock in the morning. They were in, I believe it was Chicago. I can't remember where. It was raining outside. They couldn't get a cab. They'd had too much to drink. So one of them asked, what if everybody, what if every car was a cab? And guess who went on to create Uber? So it is about taking the, the rules of your life, the mm -hmm. rules of your business, listing them as quickly as you can picking one and asking what if that rule no longer applied and getting out of your river of thinking and thinking differently. So um, that's one tool people could use. Another tool people could use is to help them stop thinking like they always do is to re-express the challenge. So for example, if I were, where are you based? At Toronto. Okay. So if I were come to Toronto and you and I are going to go into business, mm -hmm. we're going to open a car wash together. Tell me the three or four essential items we would need to put in our car wash. Uh, well, water, soap, and hoses and brushes. Okay, water, soap, hoses, and brushes. All right, well, mm -hmm. screw that. Never like car washes anyway. <laughs> so you, you and I are going to yeah. go into business, Joel. Yeah. We're going to open the most amazing auto spa. Now, what is it? What could we put in our auto spa? Uh, I guess uh, something that creates an experience because people don't, uh, okay. doesn't feel like a chore. So something that the word spa, I hear luxury, I hear experience, or so something experiential. Uh, what, video else, screens. what else? Could, video screens? What else could we put in a spa? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that business well. So that, that is a good one. You, yeah. Come on. What are, put stars? What do you see in stars? Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess there's, <laughs> there, there's some sort of luxury when I hear the word spa. So I, I so, guess. So walk, close your eyes, walk into a spa. Tell me what you see. Uh, I hear music, uh, uh, smells, um, uh, comfort, um uh somehow your your tension is just released as soon as you walk in because well, you hear but, the music but, but, what, right so you said water you said yeah. you said masseuse barista so yeah. all i did was stop you from thinking as you always did when i say car wash you went into your river of thinking of what you know to belong in a car wash you right. said water brushes soap and vacuum yeah. i said spa suddenly we're into robes baristas and masseuses all right. i did was re-express the challenge to stop you thinking the way you always have and give you permission to stop think differently. Walt was the master. Right. Yeah. Uh, he's, on July 17th, 1955, he created a level of hospitality that's never been replicated or duplicated simply by re-expressing the challenge. He said, we will not have any customers in our park. We will only have guests. Mm -hmm. Now think about, think about how you're treated when you go somewhere as a customer and think about how you're treated when you go somewhere as a guest. Um, he said, we will not have employees in our park. We'll only have cast members. There'll be cast or Role yeah. in the show. They'll wear a costume, not a uniform, on stage or backstage. And with that, simply gave everybody a badge of honor. So, fast forward to uh, 2011. If we ask the same question we ask every single day, how might we make more money? We could have put the gate price up at the theme parks and we'd have made our quarterly results. That's called iteration, not innovation. But instead of saying, how might we make more money? And companies that continue to ask themselves, how might we make more money are going to go out of business because Generation Z are going to, because they're still product centric and they need to become consumer centric. So mm -hmm. instead of saying, how might we make more money? We said, how might we so serve the biggest consumer pain point or solve the biggest consumer pain point? We all know what it was, standing in lines. So we said, what if there were no lines? We used the what if tool. We didn't know how to do it. Again, if you know how to do it, it's iteration, not innovation. So we said, well, what if we eliminated the front desks in our hotels, the turnstiles to our parks, the lines for your favorite attractions or character meeting groups or to pay for food or to pay for merchandise? And sure enough, we looked around the world and look, RFID technology. And so now when you visit Disney World, you get Disney's magic band in the mail if you're staying in one of their hotels. Mm -hmm. And um, it is your room key. You don't wait to check in or check out. It is your theme park ticket. You just swipe the turnstile and go. It has your reservations for your favorite character meeting greets and rides on it. You don't stand in line for them anymore. You want to pay for an item of merchandise? Touch it once, it goes to your hotel room. Touch it twice, it goes to your house. Food, I've saved my hot dog with my pickles on the side. I'm going to Pinocchio's Village House for lunch today. I'm sitting at table 47. The restaurant knows I'm here. The food comes fresh to me. Had we have asked how might we make more money, which is right. the question that will continue to put people out of business, yeah. because that's the way we used to do business, not the way we should be doing business, we'd have raised the prices 3%.
But because we asked how might we solve the biggest consumer pain point, the average consumer now has between 90 and 120 minutes free time a day, which has resulted in record revenues. Uh, and not only that, but data. Millions, tens of millions of people pouring through the gates every year are live crowdsourcing the future design of every product and service City Parts creates by simply telling them what they like and what they don't. So those are two. two so the what if tool is about p t listing the rules, yes. picking one and saying, what if that rule no longer existed? And then the uh, the re-expression tool is just about are, are we in the uh, are we in the car wash business or we're in the auto spa business? Do we have guests or do we have customers? Uh, how might we make more money? How might we solve the biggest consumer pain point? D Duncan, this is this so much gold in there. Um, you know, this permission to think differently. You know, ties in with with looking at the, the they tie in so much, right? With the what if look, looking at uh, you know, example the the car wash and saying stuck there and saying, well, how can we make more money from the car wash? And go, well, hang on, what if you know, looking at what what are some of the standard rules that you have, uh, and then saying, well, let's <laughs> let's not be focused on the money. Let's give ourselves permission to think differently, um, and. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the Disney example is so good because everyone wants to mirror that or copy that, but that's not innovative thinking, right? That's, um, but, it's just not, but here's the thing. These are just creative problem solving tools. I don't care yeah. if you're the Walt Disney company with the resources you've got or two guys and a dog, you can still list the rules of your industry, pick one and ask what if that rule no longer took place. Another thing you can do, which is cheap and easy, is you mm -hmm. can bring a, na a naive expert into every session you run. What is a naive expert and why should they be in your session? They don't work for you and they don't work in your industry. Uh, so what does that give them permission to do that you can't? It gives them permission to ask all the silly questions you're too embarrassed to ask in front of your peers. It gives them permission to throw out the audacious idea and governed by your politics, your turf, your hierarchy and your constraints. And this is the way we do it here. They will not solve the challenge for you, but they will stop you thinking the way you always have and help you think differently. So an example, do you have a pen and a piece of paper in front of you? I do. Good. All right. So we were designing a new retail dining and entertainment complex for Hong Kong Disneyland. Okay. And I invited into the room. Uh, we had in the room 12 white male over 50 American architects. That's called mm -hmm. groupthink. <laughs> so I invited into the room as my naive expert, a young mm -hmm. Chinese lady who was a chef because she was the antithesis of everybody else in the room. And I gave them the same seven second challenge you're about to take on. Okay. So I'm going to name an object. You're going to draw it, but you only have seven seconds. Okay. okay. And then don't, yeah. sh don't show it to me. Sure. Um, so I would like you please to draw a house. Okay. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Pen down. Don't show it to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, did you or did you not draw one door and did you or did you not draw it in the front in the middle of the house? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, two windows and bars over them? Uh, close. One window. No bars. All right. Okay. All right. And, oh, let me guess the shape of the roof. Mm, triangle? <laughs> it's like you're here. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. So, here's the thing. <laughs> yeah. so, 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 here's what happened. All the white... Uh, uh, male American architects drew what you did. They all drew the same thing. They stayed in their river of thinking what a house should look like. The young Chinese female chef drew uh, a dim sum bowl that we eat our dim sum out of mm -hmm. with a, a, a shrimp ball and a pork ball and a little Chinese lady waving out of the window. Um, so when we all showed our pictures, all of ours looked identical except hers. And we all laughed because we realized we stayed in our river of thinking what a house should look like. Right. She gave us permission to get out of our river of thinking and think differently. And uh, on the, our, our challenge was to create a new retail dining and entertainment complex for Hong Kong Disneyland. And what she gave us permission to do was consider audacious architecture. And on the way out the door, somebody slapped a post-it note over her drawing that simply said, um, dim sum architecture, um, distinctly Disney, authentically Chinese. Seven years later, the strategic brand positioning for the Shanghai Disney Resort, the guy did everything we did, including the design of the park, was distinctly Disney, authentically Chinese. But here's the point, and here's the point most companies don't understand. We hire African Americans in and we tell them to work on the African American business. We hire Hispanics and we tell them to work on the Hispanic business. But nobody's yet walked in the room and said, well, then you should all be working on the old white men business because we'd be offended. But we treat other people like that every day. What we don't understand is the power of diversity. Diversity is innovation. If somebody doesn't look yeah. like you, they don't think like you. And if they don't think like you, they can help you think differently.
Well, that that's exactly like your uh, your NBA, but the virtual NBA, right? If everybody's in the NBA, um, that's all we know. But if if you bring in that next generation that isn't interested in live sports, but they're interested in virtual sports, but if they're not invited yeah. to that meeting, they they never got that. They never got that memo. Yeah, and we still don't invite our interns into our into our senior meetings. Yeah, this is uh, so. This is good because this is, I think, where we are at in the world right now. Is that um, we're we're feeling paralyzed for so many people. We're feeling paralyzed with uh, with the fear, with the anxiety of what is going to go next. So it, it sounds like if we're able to step back and and expand our perspective and invite the people that we would not necessarily think of inviting into that discussion. Um, to look at ways to rebrand or redevelop or take our business, uh, whether it be one person or a company, uh, to uh, to another level. It's it's we need diversity of thought. We can't just surround ourselves with the same people who look like us and think like us. No, and it's easy for people to say, "Oh, he was an executive at Disney. He doesn't have to take risks." Okay, well, after 31 years of the Walt Disney Company, I threw myself off a cliff and said, I'm out. And people yeah. said, well, are you mad? Why would you do, are you screwy? You were head of innovation creativity. Well, yeah, okay. I was there 30 years, 30, three zero. And I was given the, and it was a wonderful company to work for. And I was given a bronze Jiminy Cricket, thank you for 30 magical years of service statue. And I kind of looked in and thought, you know what? I got to do what I want to do. And here's, mm. here's my message is at school, you were either good or crap at math and you were either good or bad at history. And chances are you were either good at the sciences or good at the arts. And whichever you were liked the most, you got the best grade in it. It's called common sense, by the way. Mm-hmm. So if you pick your, what, what are you really passionate about? What do you love doing? I don't care what it is. If you do what you love, you'll be really good at it. And so when I left Disney, I spotted this, what I call a gap in the market plus my passion point. The gap in the market is this. Innovation was trendy 10 years ago, and now it's about survival for most of the big legacy brands, and most of them won't make it because they'll continue to do business as usual. Um, but now, and we're all, all the C-suites are standing up there saying, we must take risks, you must mm-hmm. innovate, we must right. think differently, we, right. must, we must be brave. <laughs> and all of their employees are sitting there going, yeah, that's great, you're going to show me how? And nobody's showing people how. Giving people a, a simple toolkit that makes innovation easy creativity tangible and the process fun why should you make it fun because fred and sally are good people they work for you for a year or 20 years but they have no incentive to use this toolkit if you don't make it fun if you make it enjoyable you can't change a culture by talking about it you can only change a culture by giving people a toolkit they choose to use when you're not around and so and here's the other piece i am very passionate about if you do what you're good at you're, if you do what you love, you'll be really good at it. I firmly believe everybody is creative. Why do I believe that? Because most people will put their hand up and say, no, I'm not. And right. then I'll ask them if they were a child once and they'll laugh and they'll realize, oh yeah, that's right, I was. Uh-huh. And then I'll ask them about the biggest toy they were ever given for their birthday that came in the biggest box. And I'll ask them after they t- took the toy out of the box, what did they end up playing with for the next five days? And everybody's going to tell me the box uh-huh. because the box could be anything they wanted it to be. We all grew up with an amazing, we're all creative. Yeah. We all are born with an amazing imagination. And then we go to school and it starts getting shut down because the teacher says it's just a box. We're all born curious. Um, do you have children? I do. I have two boys. Yeah. How old are they? Uh, 16 and 12. Okay, well, when they were four or five, what was the number one question they used to ask you every single day, multiple times? Why, 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 and why? Children are curious. Then we go to school and we get a job and we're told there's only one right answer. So we stop asking the second why. Actually, the insights for innovation come on the fourth or fifth why and your data probably doesn't go deep enough. Um, yeah. children are really good at getting to the core consumer truth. If you tell somebody, why do you go to Disney? My data would tell me, well, we go for the rides. Well, that's a million, a couple of hundred million dollar investment. But if you pause for a minute and act childlike, not childish and ask, well, why do you go for the rides? Well, I remember small world. Well, why is that important to you? I remember the music. Well, wh- why is it you like the music? Where well, it reminds you of my mum. Well, why is that important to you? I take my daughter now. On the fifth why, you've just got to the insight for innovation. She's not coming for a new ride at all or a new capital investment strategy. She's coming for, based on her memory and her nostalgia. That's a communication campaign, not a capital investment strategy. But we tend to stop at the first why. And the last one is intuition. 
And I won't mm -hmm. go into the whole story, but I will tell you. So two things, you have 100 billion neurons in your brain, you have 100 million neurons in your stomach. As a consumer, the clothes you're wearing right now, the car you drive, the place you go on holiday, the restaurants you choose, every brand and product and service you choose to engage with, you went, you said, I went with my gut. Well, <laughs> it's a very powerful computer. Now, have you ever stared at the back of the head of somebody who you thought looked really hot and they immediately yeah. turn around and stared at you to look away really quickly? Yes, we all have. Why, how did they know you were looking at them? Intuition. It is a remarkably powerful computer. I won't go through the whole story, but I will tell you through just using intuition and not data, we created record revenues for one of our parks in Paris, um, but just purely using our intuition um, uh, to find what our data couldn't find. But here's the important point. We're all born creative. Yeah. We're all born with imagination. We're all born curious and we're all born with intuition and we've still got them, but we've been put it, we've tucked them away in favor of strategic thinking, critical thinking, planning, yeah. analysis, and strategy. Yeah. Well, and for the last 20 years, the left-hand side of the brain has dominated the way we do business and rightly so. However, the left-hand side of the brain and all the skill sets associated with it can be programmed into artificial intelligence and will. So, so but the right-hand side of the brain, I've spoken to three or four AI experts who have categorically told me that creativity, imagination, curiosity, and intuition will not be programmable into yes. AI anytime soon. Will they in the future? Who knows? But in the near future, probably up to a decade away from now, the skill sets that we're actually born with will actually become the most employable skill sets simply because they can't be replaced or programmed Absolutely. by AI. Well, and so I would encourage people to bring back out the skill sets that, you, that they, and that's basically what I do. I run workshops. A, you've got to remind people they are creative. They've got intuition. They are curious. And then B, you've got to give them the tools to do the job. Uh, absolutely. Well, first off, I mean, this, this, the, the whole idea for this podcast, This Feels Right, is exactly about that, is that too much time, uh, again, when I hear someone talking about strategy, um, my eyes start to roll because, yes, people need some logic, but they, they also, we also need to be able to connect to, to that emotional level, what we call our gut instinct. But that's really, that's our, our primal uh, uh, thing that's going on in our brain is, is that gut instinct. So absolutely, I agree with you. There's um, when we make a decision, even buying a house, uh, you might have a list of everything you want to see in that house, but you walk into the house and it just feels right. Uh, so there's certain things, but it, it also is a, a feeling. It has to speak to that intuition. So I yeah, totally and agree. He, and, and here's what my intuition tells me. Mm -hmm. Go home. Go and hug somebody. Go and tell them how much you love them. Go do a jigsaw with them. Go for a walk outside, not away from other, but away from other people. Go and just call anybody you haven't called in a while. Your mum, your dad, you thought I should call. Get on the bloody phone. Forget all of this. Nothing is important right now other than your health and your family. Go home and love your family. Lovely. Duncan, thank you so much. And that, that again, is that it's, it's giving yourself permission, which I think is, is such a theme to this, is giving yourself permission to, to think differently. Um, and, and in this time, uh, with everything that's going on, it's giving yourself permission to, to just be present and be with the people that are important. Uh, Duncan, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm sure this has created a lot of questions and people want to learn more. So Duncan, uh, where can people learn more about you and, and maybe connect with you? Yeah, sure. On social, it's just Duncan J. Wardle, which is D-U-N-C-A-N, initial J for John, W-A-R-D-L-E. Again, D-U-N-C-A-N-J-W-A-R-D-L-E or DuncanWardle.com. And uh, is this on, uh, do, do you like to connect through LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter? Is there a Does, preference? No, all of the above. I'm okay. on all of them. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, Duncan, uh, Duncan, once again, thank you so much for your time. Um, these are, this is great. The, the what if question, the permission to think differently, uh, tapping into our intuition. And finally, um, that, you know, giving ourselves permission to, to be present uh, and be with what's important and put those strategies aside. Uh, thank you for your time and all the best and good health to you. Thank you and to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to This Feels Right and we will talk to you next week.